I just wanted to set the scene as far as wines of Chile was concerned. Chile faced, Chile as a country and as a wine producing country faced certain issues at around about 10 years ago in that there was a lot of investment that had been made in Chile. They were producing a lot more wine and they were exporting a lot more wine. In fact, exports had doubled in the 90s. But better wine was being made and the image of Chile was not as good as it should have been. And there were some issues of disunity within the Chile wine industry. There wasn't much funding. In, to sum up, really, that it was at a bit of a crossroads. And in order to compete on the world stage, there were some real issues that had to be addressed. And to their immense credit, uh, the wineries collectively came together and I mean, I have to say we're quite fortunate in Chile in one way in having a relatively small number of wineries that form the core of the, of the industry. I think, Willie, you mentioned yesterday that there were several thousand wineries in, in the whole of Austria and certain, probably more in one region than there is in the whole of Chile. So it was a little easier to get wineries together. But nevertheless, the important thing is that there was unity and there was agreement to fund generic promotion properly, to ask government for some investment as well, long-term, commitment to long-term funding. And there was a, an agreement on strategic direction. And it was pretty hard-nosed. It, 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 Chile had to address some issues, with, and not all of them were uh, very complementary to itself. But to their credit, they, they came together and did that. So, since 2002, when Wines of Chile was set up in Santiago, and shortly afterwards, an office, a satellite office set up in, in the UK, which I was asked to, to set up in 2003, there's since been an office, dedicated office in the United States, and there's programs in a number of countries around the world. But there has been a common theme, and that is almost to reinvent people's awareness and, and, and the image of Chile. Because what was happening in the vineyard and what was happening in the, in the wineries was huge improvement, great diversity, great I innovation, but that wasn't being communicated. So we have set ourselves real challenges to address those issues and we hope to some extent we've had a measure of success, but this is an ongoing process. So just finally to, to set the scene, our campaign have been unashamedly focused on being active, being quite diverse in the programs that we've, that we've run, but everything has been to do with education and information. On the premise that whether you're a buyer, a sommelier, a consumer, a blogger, a wine journalist, um, Anybody that comes into contact with Chile in any shape or form must be kept aware the whole time of, of the developments that are taking place. So it's a constant process. And my premise is that if you really haven't learned anything new about Chile in the last six months, then you're already out of date. And we, will, we want to continue to do that. Now, the big question and the subject of this afternoon is how do we do that in the era of modern and more advanced forms of communication, euphemistically referred to as social media marketing. And uh, we're looking forward to sharing those ideas with you this afternoon. So that sets a bit of a scene. But uh, believe me, the map of Chile in many, many ways today is very different to what it was 10 years ago. And I think generic promotion has played a vast part in that. Wineries themselves are an essential component, but the generic uh, movement has been vital in Chile's progress. Michael, thank you very much. Okay, so that tells us where Chile is at. It doesn't really answer the questions about social media marketing, how it's done yet, but the stage is set. And since, Vili, you gave us a wonderful presentation about Austria yesterday, um, uh, this perhaps is the moment for you to lead with telling us how you are addressing the market here present, how you're communicating with the blogging fraternity, which are the platforms you use to communicate. 
Thank you, Charles. Um, I think um, it's amazing how this development, um, how fast this development takes place. And nobody ever imagined 20 years ago that when we started using cell phones, I, I remember in 1990, that someone called me from a cell phone in the streets of Salzburg and I said something like a mile away. And he was walking and phoning me. And in 20 years, how information uh, delivery and information distribution and information world had changed. So um, then I read some books. Uh, paperless office is one of those, you know, Microsoft, the story of when um, Bill Gates spoke to German bankers, what they thought the banking world would be in, in 10 years, which is now, because it was 10 years ago, I, th I think. And when we see how much has changed in between, we realize that marketing, communication about wine, generic marketing, has to seriously take into account what you are doing, what we refer to as social media, as online marketing, e-commerce, and all these things. So while I am the head of the Austrian Wine Marketing Board and I had the opportunity to present what we do yesterday, uh, my predecessors had already uh, done one very important thing, which is at the basis of all kind of uh, uh, social uh, or e-marketing that uh, <laughs> generics can do is our website, of course. You know, uh, think of tourism. Think of uh, uh, think of a, a guest house in northern Scotland. How can they advertise better than uh, via the internet plus 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 social media? What should they do with? 10,000 leaflets printed in Northern Scotland, where to send them, at what cost. So uh, we had a very good website all the time and I think we, get, uh, we got some compliments for it, you know, you have seen it. But I'm proud to announce that during my uh, management now for four years, we kept working on a new one because this is also what we uh, bodies like uh, generic bodies know it's a lot of budget that goes into this sector because your database is growing and growing and you have to adjust also the hardware and the software uh, to this a huge amount of data and uh, so we uh, invested uh, I don't want to quote figures because I had to confront my board with that over the last three years. But we will, what I can say positively is to announce that on November the 19th, uh, and I hope God is uh, generous with us and we really get that done, on November the 19th, our new website will be online. We wanted to be ready here yesterday to put the announcement. What would have been better than to announce it uh, uh, at the opening of the Congress, but we were already proud to present a brochure in English. Still some printed issues. So on the 19th, a completely new programmed uh, database behind our graphics of a new website will go online. Uh, there's a new photo database, Salem as we, Salem, as we call that, whenever you need photos, you will find them on uh, the database of the website. And it costs us a lot of work to clarify the copyrights of every photo that we have. It's so a complicated issue. Yeah? And I think this is service for bloggers and online marketing that a generic board offers correct information, good information, good articles on issues, and also uh, good photos that you can use and that you know how you can use it. So this is what we do and uh, we also are trying to develop this new website with uh, interactive tools. Julia Sevenich is here, welcome. We are working on an adventure tour that covers four uh, uh, sectors, wine tourism, 
uh, wine and food combination, which is not easy always as we see, then uh, also some interactive scenes and so on. So we are working uh, on that. Secondly, we are producing more of uh, kind of advertising material that we can uh, leave at the disposal to all kinds of trade people, journalists, bloggers, and all our things that we have materially uh, are also uh, available virtually on the website. So if we have a brochure on cheese and wine, if we have a brochure on Austrian wine and Chinese food or something like that, you can always have it online, uh, available online too. Yeah, then I, I, I stay short now. We do trips, so we sponsor events like this one. We do the wine summit every second year, Austrian wine summit, where we get 34 nations on four trips uh, through Austria. We, we sponsor trips through the Via Venum. We sponsor individual press trips. We do tastings. We are on Facebook in different countries. We have uh, collaborations with people, but let me cut here, give you the opportunity to go on, and I might be go on to our Facebook activities and other activities a little bit later. Great, Vili, thank you very much. Um, I'm just going to give a little short preamble about Portugal, which um, has done quite a lot of work, I think, trying to reach out to um, bloggers and to in, w through the social media. I'm very much aware that the UK office of Vini Portugal, w which is the body that, that promotes Portuguese wines outside the country and is represented in the UK by a lady called Judy Kendrick, She's set up a website. Um, she does quite a lot of blogging. She tweets a bit. Um, she, she makes films at shows, tastings, and puts them up on YouTube and streams them on the website. Um, she's been fairly active, and she has actually done, I think, with, with relatively small amounts of money, she has actually got the name of Portugal out there um, really more effectively than... Um, quite a lot of bigger players with larger budgets. Um, I've also got Tanya here, Tanya Oliveira, who works for Vini Portugal. Tanya, you've got, um, you've got a conference coming up, haven't you? Tell us about that. That's absolutely true. We have a conference in December called the Wines of Portugal International Conference. And actually, we will have a panel that we are going to debate a little bit this uh, subject. It's called the Wine Internet Revolution and we are having bloggers telling us a little bit what they are doing because it's interesting to see that when we are here and we are learning a lot and telling our team uh, what is going on and what the trends are, but the truth is that in the bottom of line, sometimes the producers don't really have this information and don't really know how to work with you. And that's really the point for us, is to have answer to those questions. So, for example, for Facebook, I think this is a good, I think we really want you to interact with us. So, in our case, for the wines of Portugal, uh, we have the help of Catevina that is going to help us <laughs> figure it out. But, for example, our main countries, so where we have more effort to have a better position are the US, Germany, UK, we have Brazil, we have Angola, and they all speak different languages. Should we have a unique page of Facebook? Or should we have a page for each country? Or should we have a page for each language? What do you think? The question is, to what extent the people in the US can understand the English and vice versa? <laughs> and the same, of course, applies to um, Portugal and Brazil. Um, well, yeah. Yeah, yeah, we'd love questions. Okay. Um, Michael, you, you sort of set out, set out the chili stall in, in terms of where chili is at as far as promotion is concerned. You, you were referred to social media marketing. What steps are you thinking of taking? Well, yes, my, my brief was not quite to your brief, clearly. But um, no, I mean, we're reasonably well advanced uh, in that we already have the Wines of Chile Facebook page. We have a Twitter site. We have our own YouTube channel as well. And uh, at the London Wine Fair, for instance, we, we did a YouTube clip asking all the Chilean winemakers to uh, say what they were getting out, how they were getting out of, what they were getting out of the fair and asking them which was their favorite football team. And, um, and then also at the annual tasting in London, we did a similar clip, which was hopefully a little bit more focused to consumers as well to try and 
get across some element of the fun and energy that's going into Chilean winemaking. In the United States, it's even more advanced. Juan Somavia, the head of Wines of Chile, sitting at the front here, has been very active with our U.S. office in running, I think now you've had at least five, four blogger tastings uh, live streamed. So bloggers around the United States would be sent the kits, sent the wines, um, and would be live in touch with winemakers back in Chile. And this has happened four times already in different, uh, different times of the year. And that's been very successful in getting the blogging community, if you like, much more active with, with winemakers. So there's a lot going on, but you know, I think there's rather like the word sustainability. Uh, there needs to be a lot of substance beneath the, the greenwash, and we need to do things that really work. Okay, Ryan, I see with absolute unerring, unerring precision, you have put yourself next to Kate, the, the handle towards your hand, um, who is in a position perhaps to tell us a little bit about sh how she in the UK is approaching the marketing to the blogging community of um, Oregon and Washington State. Okay, hi everybody. Um, we come from a much smaller position. Kate, why don't you stand up and sort of wave your arms around and then we can get a sort of visual. There we are, there's okay, Kate. Kate's sweet. Um, we're, we're much smaller. Um, we have a tiny, tiny budget. Um, and we basically have the problem at the moment of Washington and Oregon wines being in very low distribution within the marketplace. So our um, policy is really to try two things, to try and marry up uh, Oregon and Washington wineries looking for distribution within the UK. So if there's anybody interested here from the UK that would like an Oregon winery or not Washington winery, let me know. Um, but also then to try and uh, build the profile through PR and events and so on. So actually up until this point we've been um, doing a stand at the London Wine Trade Fair and an annual tasting, which um, for the last, we've been doing that for four years now, and that's helping to build profile for the regions um, just through a trade job, but we're getting to the point now where we have some critical mass. We now have almost 30 brands from Oregon uh, actively exporting to the UK. Um, we have a, something like 23 brands, I think, from Washington, um, so there wasn't kind of any point, or I don't mean point, but uh, there wasn't enough critical mass to be able to um, do a lot of promotion before then, but we're starting now to be able to do some consumer facing things and some outward sort of facing promotions. So um, if you follow me, I'm a Kate Sweet PR, a Kate Sweet PR lady on Twitter. Um, occasionally you'll see me pop up and I'll be tweeting the events that we, that we put on. We have a tasting in January in London, which you're welcome to come along to. Please let me know if you want an invite. Um, and at those uh, tastings, we do a separate seminar, one for Oregon, one for Washington. Um, the venue that we use has Wi-Fi um, and we will encourage going forwards, having hashtags so people can follow. Um, and that kind of thing. We obviously have the generic websites um, from, that are run from Oregon and Washington. Um, but, you know, we're just trying to tr get a little bit of a movement, trying to get people to try the wines, taste the wines, um, and, and just that kind of thing going forward. So at the moment, it's pretty low budget. <laughs> it's quite low key. Um, but I'm just trying to work out what will work best and how to direct people towards the wines that are available in the marketplace. That Thank you sense. very much, Kate. That's great. Um, now, now, guys, we, we're about halfway through what this session should run to. And I think, you know, having heard these um, good people putting out, telling you a bit about what they are doing, what they think they're doing, how they feel they're spending their budgets, um, it would be great to get a little bit of reaction from you to find out what do you think they're doing right? How we would like to improve it? There's someone at the back here. Um, Gabriella, the mic is coming towards you, sir. Do feel free to ask general questions, which then any of them may ask, answer, or, or to ask questions directed specifically at one of the, one of the generic people. Uh, yeah, th thanks very much for the, uh, for the opportunity. I, I just wanted to comment on that. 
the, the query about what sort of page to put out to, uh, for the US market, the, the, the idea about whether it needs to be regions, languages, those sorts of things. A, a question came to mind this morning with the Adega presentation by Andre saying how there was a translate uh, option for the comments that are put in place. And I think, in essence, it's a brilliant idea, but the problem is, is that the language and the net that consumers are using is evolving every day. Just the use of acronyms, the use of um, different letters and case to try and, um, to try and pronounce something either with emphasis or uh, some other meaning, often means that those, those, those terms can get lost in translation. I think the idea is really good, but is there some way that you can come up with different languages or tr translatable languages that can be custom edited and someone can be responsible for that, or is that something that's, that's just unworkable? Vili. Yeah. Vili. Um, while it's uh, still feasible to have websites in different languages, and we do have them in English, in German, in Russian, in Japanese, in Chinese, this is already a, a hell of work to get uh, the essence of the information parallel. The versions, the updates, can you imagine, it's dramatic. On the other side, um, uh, we have Facebook in German language. Uh, out of our uh, Vienna office and, or community, then we have a Facebook uh, in English language that is run uh, through our partners, uh, Austrian Trade Commission, and our partners with Brand Action Team in America. Hi, Steve. Uh, I want to say that we take it very seriously and we have a partnership with Brand Action Team who are specialists in uh, uh, social media. And Steve, three years ago, convinced me that a country like Austria, that's such a niche product, you know, our problem is to tell the intelligent consumers of wine in the world that we exist and we have great wines. That's enough. The rest they can do themselves. They can find the information on our website and so on. But how can you stay, hey, Austria is alive, we have wine, we're not only skiers. And this is what we try to do with the social media. But then we figured out that on our Facebook site uh, in English, which is uh, uh, run in New York, there's a lot of buzz going around, also of local tastings, reactions of this community, and we now are in the process of dividing them to keep, to give them the Austri to Austrian Wine US Facebook site to do what can consist, uh, what can interest a continent like Northern America. Whereas we do a generic Austrian Facebook site in English language that can also go to uh, involve Scandinavia, UK, other parts of English speaking countries or countries that we can't cover in their home language. And uh, that's also an aspect that I would focus on that a generic marketing and locality, yeah, to split that up. Absolutely. I mean, I'm, I'm very much aware sometimes I look at a, a website and I realize that it hasn't been updated. I'm not talking about generic websites now. I'm talking about any old website. It hasn't been updated for three years. The information is completely out of date. And actually to be looking for owners of websites to be not only keeping their websites up to date, which seems to be too much to ask a lot of people, but also to keep you up to date in several different languages is perhaps um, a little too much of an ask for an awful lot of people in the wine industry. Perhaps, on the other hand, this is where the social media platforms such as Facebook, such as Twitter, are much more agile and, and can react faster to current events, to news, to specific tastings. What, what do you think, folks? I mean, what is your preferred platform for delivery of news? Um, do, you, do you subscribe to news feeds? <coughs> how, do you, how do you like to be communicated to? Pair. I think while he's getting the microphone, if I may, I mean, I think it's, it's very much a question of trying to walk before you can run, and uh, budgets always come into, into the equation. Most generic offices are funded by the winery base, uh, unless they're very fortunate in having large swathes of European money thrown at them, and um, I know some are and some aren't, but uh, so you've got to apportion those funds as, as, uh, as well as possible, and I think 
At the moment, we will also be having a separate Facebook site for the United States and the UK as an example in order to prevent people having to wade through lots of information about tastings in New York and Miami. There must also be a bit of a, a feeling that you, you put your money where you're likely to have success. You direct your efforts at the best. I think the, the idea is to, is to sow the seeds and then the, the, the community takes over and passes it on on your behalf. Pair. Yes, I, I stood up here at the corner, uh, side. Um, uh, I have quite a lot of uh, opinions about this. Unfortunately, most of my opinions on this are very negative. Um, I'm a blogger, I'm a journalist, and I'm a wine tour operator. We bring hundreds of people to wine uh, regions every year. And I've very rarely had any useful information from the generic bodies. Uh, having said this, I must say that the two of the ones on the stage, uh, Portugal and Austria, are perhaps the two uh, that really do give some useful information, so thank you, you're doing a good job. Chile, I'm not very familiar with what you're doing at all. Um, what do I want? Uh, I, I want two things, uh, actually. I, I want to receive proactive, I want to receive information from your side where you push out information proactively. Uh, one example of that, which is interesting, is Austria's email, I think once every year, where you send out a vintage report. This was what happened to the vintage. Uh, and it's, uh, it's fairly technical. Um, it's uh, maybe a one page A4, uh, and it's very useful. It's very interesting. I can use that to, to blog about, I can use that to read, write about. Um, other th things which are, um, well, the other thing which is important, apart from your being proactive, is that you must be responsive. Um, if I send you an email or send an email to a generic body, I would like to receive a response. It has happened so many times that I send an email asking for questions, asking for information, and I just don't get a response. Or I get uh, a, yeah, someone had the same opinion apparently. Or I get a response pointing to uh, some website which is quite useless. Uh, in, uh, underneath all this is uh, something which uh, I think uh, the, the gentleman from Chile said, you have to have useful information, uh, <coughs> information that I get from the generic bodies, or the marketing organizations, it shouldn't be glossy marketing material. It should be useful. It should, uh, again, take an example from Austria. The brochure that you uh, handed out yesterday, which was oh, actually a thick magazine, that's very useful information. It's almost like a, a, a small book uh, on Austrian wines. Very good. Uh, but the, the glossy websites, the, the uh, generic uh, press releases, uh, which says basically nothing, that's not interesting. Um, coming to social media, I'm, uh, I don't really think that's important f for you at the moment. Not from my perspective, it might be important from your perspective, but I don't really care what you do on social media today. Uh, I, I need uh, useful information when, that you send out and I need your responses when I ask for something, but I'm not going to look on Facebook for general information on, on Chile or Portugal. Okay, I, that, that's a good point about the, the vintage report. Thanks very much, Per, and also <laughs> answering emails. That's another, okay, um, extra, the another the very good one. Um, I, I think that Portugal also does a vintage report, which I get certainly as someone who writes fairly regularly about Portugal. I don't know whether other people in the room get this as well. And, and maybe this is the point at which I have to say, if you want such particular pieces of information, get in touch with the generic organization and make your desires known. It's very easy to add another name to a list of email, um, to, uh, of, to whom emails like that are sent. I find it very interesting also, occasionally to have updates on plantations who has what planted where, which are the most important grape varieties, 
um, you know, how much Pinot Noir is planted in New Zealand, how much more Grüner Feldliner there is in Austria than any other grape variety, those kind of facts and figures which are um, really quite difficult to find. I mean, maybe they're easily available on your website, Billy. Um, but I mean, that sort of thing is really interesting. And actually, you take a region like the Weinviertel where everything, everything is Grüner Feldliner, one uh, almost. You Billy. know, Charles, uh, as we know, it's not even easy for us to get this information, how many hectares of something are, you know? Uh, when I was in Italy and I was working uh, for a great Italian company with the black and white labels, the most expensive wines they have, um, uh, we had beautiful material on Piedmont, Albo Vigneti, very good. It was hard to get, you know? It took me five years to work in Piedmont until I got the first copy. Uh, not to speak about data about uh, vineyards in Italy, including southern Italy, you know. Sometimes they, they grabbed up uh, vineyards, got the money from the EU for grabbing up, sold the planting rights uh, to other people, and second cash for vineyards that never existed, you know. So we tried to get data on Austrian wine and... Um, That's a good story, Billy. <laughs> I'm sure there are people out here who would love that kind of story. No, no, that's, that's, uh, that's how Southern Italy works, you know. And it's not so easy for all countries to exactly know the hectare, the acreage of vineyards, you know. Sometimes the New World is much better on that, you know, because they uh, have fewer estates, uh, a new planting system and so on. But here we gather the most uh, reliable information on Austrian wine and it took me days and days with the statistics office. And we also have uh, data in our previous uh, things that differ from one from each, from each uh, the other. Now, this is what we say, this is what we have, and it's the closest uh, mirror of reality, but it's not easy. I know, it takes time, but you're lucky you have access to that statistics office. Um, I have to say, in Portugal, there is a website run by the Ministry of Agriculture for the Instituto do, da Vinha e do Vinho, um, which has a lot of statistics online. You can see them. They are there. They're not sort of completely up to date, but they're, they're near as damn it up to date. It's, it's actually a very useful website if you speak Portuguese and you know where to look for it. Um, but um, these things are not. I think so. This is sort of basic information that I find interesting. I find useful in what I do. Um, perhaps it's of interest to you, for you, but I mean, tell me, is there any other? Yes, Julia. Uh, my, I have another question for all three of you. Um, how much user-generated content do you want on your different social media platforms? And how are you prepared to deal with that, both positive and negative? Well, I guess uh, it depends on whether one's talking about consumers or trade. But if, if, we're, if, we're, if we're talking about consumer feedback, you know, I think it is important uh, to have as much feedback as possible. I mean, the whole, the whole purpose of what we're here to, to discuss over these two days is, is about interaction, it's about communication, it's about how uh, the, the conversation around the world is so much more open. And I think uh, as much feedback as possible because it's a two-way two process. And I think there's a lot of wineries out there that are behind their winery walls not communicating. I mean, the, the wine trade has been very bad at communicating for several centuries, but it's now beginning to learn. So yes, it's absolutely vital to have that flow of communication, whether it's on Twitter, Facebook, or even on a website, comments on a website. Really? It very much depends on which format you're talking about. Uh, on Facebook, we want, of course, as much as possible as serious and uh, uh, comments or, or exchange of opinions. We have uh, an own website dedicated to wine tourism, and uh, we are not yet there where we wanted to have, because we could have had at, on this website where we cannot judge uh, a winery a hotel or a winery accommodation or a hire again in the vineyards. We cannot say this one is good, although we know, but 
generic body cannot judge. Well, trip advisor system would be fantastic for that, you know. If we could generate traffic on this tourism website, the judgment and the rating of the performance of the uh, services of the uh, estates they uh, provide can be generated by the public. And this would be ideal, an ideal case where we want traffic and opinion uh, coming from the public as much as possible. It's nicer to have 160 ratings of a hotel than one. Yeah? Uh, on the other hand, we are all, we are 20 people in our uh, uh, office and we are doing all the fairs and events and so on. I'm basically running three companies with all implications and then I'm Mr. Austria with one secretary and assistant. I'm Mr. Austria in the Americas and with the other in Japan, Western, Southern Europe. So it, you can imagine that I have limited time to read comments uh, on Twitter, Facebook, and so on about Austrian generic marketing. It, it's a lovely idea, the idea of a sort of TripAdvisor type rating for wineries and their visitability and the facilities they offer. Um, do you think you'd have the possibility of providing a platform on your website for, yes, to we express will. those views? Yes, we will. Uh, when we go online, this is a feature that we won't have because you cannot do all at once. We had 5,000 pages uh, to uh, transfer from the old to the new uh, website and to verify if still uh, the content is right and then provide at least 1,000 pages in the different languages because not all is relevant for Chinese uh, website. I have to say I find myself wondering whether all those 5,000 pages, some of you might be able to... No, but, but we, we also lose. want to keep track with all the press releases of the last 10 years that we have because, you know, uh, concerning all new DSCs and so on, that's not all stuff because somebody of you might be interested in writing an article about Weinviertel and then you need the articles when it was created uh, seven years ago and you need all that. So we provide it, but it's a lot of work. Good. Here. Um, sorry, Hi. sir. Um, I'm Giampiero Nadali, wine blogger from Italy. I'm not intervening now uh, about the question of uh, uh, the, the Italian wineries and Italian uh, vineyards, but uh, um, I'm still not, not interested in uh, Facebook or not Facebook. Uh, I think it's static, uh, it's not a strategical point of view. Um, I don't want to make any strategical decision in the hands of a private company that uh, tomorrow can change uh, the access to the system. I hate Facebook personally. I don't like very much. I don't think it's a, uh, a long-term uh, tool in order to develop something uh, interesting or, or, or strategic. Uh, what I think is strategic, uh, this morning we, told, we, we speak uh, uh, about uh, database. Uh, databases are the uh, real architecture, the real core of uh, uh, the stuff we made uh, every day. So uh, what I'm more interested uh, about is uh, that uh, not only you, but also us in Italy, uh, I know it's very difficult, uh, to build uh, and to manage uh, uh, georeferencing uh, wineries uh, and, uh, and wines. Uh, because uh, all of us, uh, we are to be prepared in Europe uh, because uh, some uh, new uh, rules are coming from the European Union. Um, they are thinking about uh, to develop a traceability, not only of wineries and, and bottles, but also of grapes, directly to the, to the core information from which vineyards this grape uh, and this bottle are coming from. I'm involved in one of these projects, uh, but I can assure you that uh, is a terrific, uh, and um, in terms also of marketing of our uh, uh, territories will be very, very important. I appreciate very much from, from all of you that uh, uh, you are communicating wine through maps. I like very much uh, this approach. Me too, in Italy, I'm uh, struggle, uh, struggling uh, every day uh, to convince people in the wine business to use maps to, to, to speak about wine. But we need some more, uh, uh, maps are uh, made for paper, 
and we need something more deep, something more powerful. So please uh, try and start to develop uh, um, georeferencing. And what about this matter? What are you doing now? Are you probably you have some projects uh, in your uh, in your uh, lineup? Uh, can, can you tell me something about that? Can you repeat the notion geo? What was the georeferencing? Georeferencing. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, first of all, um, the question why I said this about Italy, this is a single case uh, that uh, was referred to me. I don't, you know, I love uh, Italian wines too much. But you don't have a catasta in Italy, and EU wants to abolish catastas by, uh, over the next years. So we have a catasta that goes back to the monarchy. It's an old system. But, you know, also uh, uh, georeference and so on. First of all, we need, like, like we had a, a vineyard classification system that my friends do, and I hate it because it's 14 vintners doing a classification for their vineyards. Very nice. What do you say is a generic, yeah? First of all, I say, if we don't want to speak about a place, and place is very much for the identity of wine and for enjoying wine, we all want to know, oh, can we identify where this wine comes from? That's part of the pleasure, you know? It's the f first georeferencing is my nose, if I can develop. Oh, Barolo, mm, must be Barolo, or Barbaresco. So, if we don't have good maps, catasters, or other systems, electronic systems, of stating where the vineyards are, how can you talk about single vineyards and expression of terroir and wine and things like that? There's a lot of cheating around. And I'm not talking about Italy, I'm talking about us all, you know. So, before we, uh, and georeferencing, if we take it seriously as the Burgundi Burgundians do, where square meters decide if the wine is a Grand Cru or not, then georeferencing would be a very great thing to verify if it's the truth what is told. Because, you know, so much in wine should be the truth, as in Vino Veritas says, but sometimes I, I, I realized that I was tasting a wine and I was talking, yeah, the calcareous soil of that, and, and behind they were laughing. <laughs> I have put the other wine in, you know. So let's start from essential things. Naming wines as truly as they are, and what can be said. And as specific as we get with place in wine, then let's be as true as possible. And if systems come, georeferencing, I don't know if it's possible to say, this is from uh, Roncaliete, or this is from uh, Latache, or this is from, huh? would be very nice. Yeah, it was. He said uh, there's a project in France, yeah? Yeah. yeah. Pardon? Geo Wine. Geo Wine. Uh, check it on, uh, Google it out at Geo Wine or wherever you search. Geo Wine uh, is a project uh, that uh, I think uh, there's a lot uh, to, uh, that we can expect from that uh, if we think that place in wine and coordinating styles of wine to place. Uh, is important. Well, uh, regionality in all its guises is important. One has to give the consumer especially, we have to feed them little bits of information in order for them to build up more of a picture. They don't have to understand it, but they have to know that there is complexity. And I think our job is to, uh, I said it before, to sow those seeds of interest with especially consumers and then they can, at their own pace, find out more information from all sorts of different sources. But, you know, I defy most British consumers to understand most of the Appalachian Controle regions in France, but they know that there are many, and that helps the image of complexity and tradition and heritage. And I think as far as Chile is concerned, we're doing a lot to try and introduce the notion of regionality, even though I concede that at this early stage, most people won't know the difference between the regions. 
but you have to give them by whatever means, but I, I think any means possible to, to talk about place and the, and the importance of place. And I think also that we have classification systems here in Europe which perhaps are different from the kind of classification systems that have come into being in some of the countries in, in the southern hemisphere perhaps. Um, the, 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 you know, the Burgundian, the Austrian, the German system of very precise vineyard classification are very different from the broad regional swathes in countries like Chile, Australia, New Zealand. And, and, and also, I think, to be fair to those countries, they're beginning to find particular places which are very special and, and pointing the finger towards them as being wonderful, wonderful spots, wonderful little bits of terroir. Anyway, let's move on. Um, something down here. There was someone at the back there, but perhaps um, at the moment. Yes, sir, down on the aisle. Hi. Um, just a couple of points. Uh, on, so I've got a blog myself. Uh, it's called My Grape Escape. And I kind of, similar to you, um, with Austria, I suppose you're not trying to market a, a wine, say like Ryan or a company like Derek here in front of me. It's a kind of, it's a, you're trying to market the country and get, pe get consumers to think Austria when they want to buy a wine. So you've got to think of your identity. And I have a normal job during the day and I have a blog I write at night. And the social media side, it's not time consuming whatsoever. I'll update it, you know, while I'm waiting for a coffee or waiting for something to print or, you know, spend a little while at night before I go to bed, you know, getting back to everyone who gets in touch with me. And it's not time consuming at all. So, I mean, I, I don't think that's, that, that should be a, you know, a barrier to kind of creating a social media strategy. Um, second point is just on the, I really agree, like the sense of place and sense of regionality is really important. And I see in my own country, in Ireland, and I'm sure it's similar in the UK, uh, the likes of Spanish and Portuguese wines have done really well because consumers often go there on holidays and they come back, they had wonderful wines, they had wonderful experiences, and they want to kind of recreate that when they get home. Similarly, a lot of people I know, a lot of Irish people and UK people go abroad to Austria skiing, or mainly for skiing. So why not ensure that when they go to Austria, they have this great experience of skiing and mountains and great food and great wine. And really make sure each and every single one of them goes home, tells all their friends about the great wine they had. And, you know, I'm, I'm just kind of thinking, would your marketing budgets be better um, spent? I mean, I've got tons of fantastic-looking material sitting on my bed at home, lovely pictures, lovely, you know, food matches and stuff. But, like, if I went to any other region in the world, I'd probably get the same stuff. So, you know, I'm not sure if beautiful scenery and beautiful food is, is a great way to, to uh, differentiate, differentiate yourself. So, like, you know, because we've got so much information coming at us, Personally, I don't think I'm going to get the time to reach for those brochures, and I'd imagine there's a huge amount of effort gone into that. I could be wrong here, but you know, it's just me. I have a lot, I have a lot of things to do. Whereas if I had you know, a video blog, if I could watch that or read something that's really entertaining and really catches me and stands out uh, of all the, the information churning at me, I don't know whether it's you know, an attractive blonde lady you know, serving Austrian wine or you know, a crazy skiing man coming down a black piece in a onesie, you know. Something fun, something different, something out there. So that's just, there's my thoughts. Thank you very much. Um, behind there, and then we've got, I can't remember, lady over here on the side. Thanks. Um, Susanna Stackel from oh, Austrian sorry, Wines. Susanna, sorry. <laughs> um, I just have a question to the audience. Um, as one of these people trying to get the right information from the generics to the wine people, um, and I'm also the one to send out the vintage report we talked about, um, how much, I know Gabriella told me at the Wine Bloggers Conference, paperless, everything, how much do you read the information on your USB stick? How much of the information it saves on your... Us a, it saves us a lot of work uh, that we don't have to print it out, we don't have to sort it into the press maps. How much do you really need the USB stick? Because we've got all the information on, on our website, if it's glossy or not, but we've got all the information on, on our website. We've got a lot of hands going up, Susanna. Um, I don't know whether the answer is just to give us a link to the website. 
Oh. I, I think that no. the information okay. on the USB stick is super helpful because not only do you not have to print it out, but I'm traveling back home to the United States and I have very, very limited space. And if I have papers when I get home, I get so many papers from so many different people, it kind of gets lost and it kind of gets jumbled up. I'll save the USB sticks and I might be overwhelmed with information. Sometimes it might be a month or two till a blogger can really get home, process the information and you know, do a wine region justice, but at least I have that information there. And I really, really, really love having the information on or the pictures or video on a USB. It's way well, easier. I, th I think like everything, um, we have, as generics, we have to be as adaptable as possible. Uh, there will be many of you, especially here in this room, that prefer modern methods. And if you go on a press trip, you'd much prefer to give them your USB stick to get the information rather than great big stacks of, of material and uh, even CD-ROMs. You can just have it on the, on the... But there will be others. I mean, w I have a press list of UK journalists, and I can assure you there are still a number on that database in red... Where, the, uh, where it says, do not send attachments to email. In fact, there's one very well-known journalist who doesn't even have email. But, um, so there are some that, it has to be in paper. The invitation has to go by post, otherwise they won't even consider coming to the event. That's horses for courses, whatever that is. In but that's uh, a question that we resolved in short time, I think. Yes, it's a matter of time. Mm -hmm. yeah. Jim. I think one service the generics could do is to try and persuade producers not to give or offer <coughs> paper to journalists visiting and not to get upset if it's refused. Over 20 years of writing about wine, I hate to think of the tons of paper that I have thrown away. At least you so can now recycle it. Please. You, now it would be recycled, yes, indeed. Believe me, um, Jim, there's a lot, of, a lot of information we have to persuade the wineries to do and not to do, and, and that's certainly one of them. They would, I think they'd save a lot of money. And not to give you too many big meals. <laughs> oh. Right. I don't mean you personally, Jim, I'm sorry. <laughs> that sounded all wrong. <laughs> David. Michael, most of us still eat. <laughs> <laughs> I, I approach your question about what can you do from two different points of view, both from the Pallet Press and from the ad network. But I, I would like, and this is going to sound strange, I would like the generics to be less generic. I have been, Chile has done a wonderful job of sending samples. If I get any more samples from Chile, I'm going to have to build an ark. Um, but I've never gotten a story out of you. You, you tell me, you, you set up a tastings, and you do a wonderful job, and we hear from the winemakers and we taste the wines. But at least for, in Pallet Press and the hundred or so sites that are affiliated with us, bloggers are looking for stories. Some just do reviews, but many are looking for a story. And what, certainly from a journalistic point of view we would like, is not something you send to everybody. Um, we want leads. If you have a story, and it doesn't matter whether the story is somebody has had a particularly brilliant vintage, or somebody killed the winemaker. We want the story. That's what we're in the business of writing. And we don't get that. What we get is the same thing everybody else in the room gets. And I know everybody else in the room got it, so I'm not going to write about it. Thank you very much indeed to those who've contributed, to Michael, to Vili, to Tanya, to Kate, and to all of you for asking questions. This has been your moment actually to ask these guys how they can make your lives better. And I'm sure they've taken in what you've said. I thought the point made by our Irish colleague about um, the link between wine and tourism is such a good one. It's so much easier to write if you've got a, a feel for the place, uh, the smell of the place, anything like that. But one thing I would say as someone who's been writing about wine for a few years now is that wine budgets and tourism budgets are separate budgets. And the people who promote tourism are very usually unwilling to give up a cent of their budget to try and help out the guys who are trying to promote wine. Um, it's stupid, but that's the way it is. Billy, yeah. Uh, to the last gentleman, very, very good with the stories. 
On the other hand, what's the story a generic can tell? That I ask myself this every day in the morning. I can tell you so many stories about individual winemakers, including the non-legitimate girls they are sleeping yes, with yes, and so on. Yes. But that's not the story I can tell as a generic. It's very difficult for generics to, to find uh, stories that are interesting for those people. I try to use humor to sell you the boring things you have to say about a country, you know? Perhaps you need to set up an anonymous Twitter identity. <laughs> no, but uh, it's also a combination. If you want to market a country, it's a combination between information that goes out of the estates themselves, and they have to tell the personal stories more than we can ever do. And we had a framework. We, I always say we are the Air Force, but you are the infantry. Yeah? Uh, let's not be so military. But we give the umbrella of information, try to structure the chaos, and try to also find some interesting stories. But the better stories are told by the winemakers themselves, by the families, and the best story is what is in the glasses. Thank you very much. <laughs> it's been a wonderful